Uh, welcome to our estimate and bidding process. Uh, it's a, a presentation in partnership with Washington PTAC and the small business uh, or the, the Northwest Small Business Transportation Resource Center. And today we have Larry Bork and he is with Veneer Construction Management. And uh, he's going to teach us a thing or two about uh, putting together an estimate and how to, to walk through the bidding process. In today's session, uh, Larry's going to go ahead and, and put together this presentation until 1 o'clock. And then from 1 o'clock to 1.15, we're going to have a question and answer period. And so as we go through this, please go ahead and start putting your questions in the chat and then we will address those in the question and answer period. At 1.15, we're gonna uh, take a little five minute break and then we'll come back at uh, 1.20 and then Larry will continue uh, talking specifically about markups and general conditions. And then we'll uh, finish up with another question and answer period and uh, if we have some time, Larry's going to maybe uh, give you an idea as to uh, what's coming down the, the road, literally, for um, some of the veneer construction projects. And then we should be out of here by 3 o'clock. So we appreciate everybody being here. And we would greatly appreciate if on your um, identification, if you would list your name and uh, the name of your company, and that way we can get you fully recorded as a participant. So with no further ado, um, oh, by the way, we are recording this event. And um, when we take our, uh, you know, if we get a little uh, lull in the action here, we have a couple of polls that, that we will uh, uh, post up for you to give us some response on. So uh, we'll, we'll let Larry uh, take over and we'll see you guys in a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. And um, good morning, everyone. I guess it's, no, it's good afternoon, I guess for right now. It's five after 12. Um, my name is Larry Bjork, as, uh, as I was introduced, and I work for Vanner Construction, maybe a little bit of a correction on the pronunciation of the name, it's Vanner, and um, we have an office in Renton, Washington. Um, we also are located in, um, in Port Angeles. We have an office in Port Angeles. Um, you will see the name of Craig Fulton um, on, the, on the slide. Unfortunately, Craig decided that he was going to take a vacation and go down to the Oregon coast and drink beer this this week. So he's down there today. He sends his greetings, and I believe that you'll be hearing from Craig. I think on the twentieth, as I as I understand it, I'm not quite sure, but Craig uh, is not able to be with us today. Uh, so there he is, and there I am, and um, we are both project directors. And um, as I said, Craig uh, Craig manages our um, our office in Port Angeles and um, he's doing a great job over there with the team that he's assembled and I support him uh, from time to time on projects that he's working on. <clears throat> so a little bit about me. Um, I have a 40 year career in commercial construction. I worked for Baugh Construction for 25 years. Um, Baugh is now Skanska. You've probably heard of Skanska. I don't know that you've heard of Baugh, but maybe. Uh, and then for 15 years, I was working at least Crutcher Lewis, and um, uh, both of those firms were family owned, um, and both of those firms uh, did major construction projects in the city of Seattle and, and in Portland. And so um, I was fortunate enough to work for both firms for, for 40 years, and then I retired in 2011, and uh, I became an estimating instructor at the University of Washington. <clears throat> Um, I teach uh, both estimating classes at the UW uh, in the under, undergraduate program I'm currently uh, teaching right now. Uh, I will have a class at 4.30 after I'm done with all of you today at 3. I'll jump into my class at 4.30 out there. So it's been a good 
a productive career for myself. And uh, again, I'm really happy to be here today and looking forward to our conversation. Um, uh, as, as Leslie indicated, uh, if you have a question, you, um, you can put it in the chat. However, if there's something that you're just dying to ask me and you don't want to wait till the end, I am happy to take questions at any time. I certainly don't want to hijack any agenda that she may have, but if you do have a question and, and you would like to ask it, please feel free to do that. So from now on until about one o'clock, I want to talk to you about the process of putting an estimate together. Um, uh, and then at, at uh, one or one, 110 or 120, whatever it's going to be, we're going to get into markups and general conditions. So both very important in terms of the total project estimate that that uh, that you all are um, are at some point in time going to be preparing. And so uh, wanted to give you an idea of what we were going to do today. This is a little bit of a challenge for me because, as you know, um, I teach estimating, as I just said, and um, <clears throat> I take 10 weeks to teach these students how to estimate construction projects. And we're going to try to do it in a couple of hours today. And I know that you all know how to do it. And this is more information than anything else. But um, we're going to go through this today. And um, I'm sure that uh, I will. I hope it will be informative for you. And uh, it's certainly fun for me to be able to do this. So um, I think the first thing I want to talk to you about today is the different types of delivery methods. And again, I'm going to be coming uh, at this today from the perspective of a general contractor. Uh, and I don't know how many of you are contractors or specialty subcontractors, but uh, I know that all of you are, are asked from time to time to prepare estimates for the work that you do. And so hopefully this is going to be helpful in, in, in trying to understand it from my, from my perspective and from the perspective of the general contractor. There are many different types of delivery methods that, that contractors are involved in um, uh, in the marketplace today. The, the first one at the top is uh, lump sum competitive bids. And usually that's a public project that has a lump sum competitive bid. We call that design bid build. And in design bid build, um, the architect designs the job, they put it out for bid, and contractors bid on the on the work, and they um, they select the low bidder. And I could go on for hours about why that's not necessarily a a good procurement method for most contractors now, especially in a busy market. But we can say that for another conversation, perhaps. The next one is the guaranteed maximum price, uh, GMP. It's negotiated rather than bid. You negotiate with a contractor to usually negotiate fees or general conditions, things like that, and then you select them. The benefit of, of that one and the one that's coming up is, um, is that the contractor is involved with the um, with the design team all the way through the design process. So the owner gets a lot of benefit from having the contractor involved early on in terms of budgeting and scheduling and things like that. Uh, the next one is, is what they call design build. You've all heard of design build. You can use this procurement method both in the public and the private sector. And um, the major difference from the one above it, which is the guaranteed maximum price negotiated, is that the contractor hires the designer. So the owner will go out and he will secure the services of a design build team. And that includes the contractor. And then the contractor hires the designer and work together to prepare uh, and to design a project that meets the owner's needs, meets their budget, and meets their schedule. So, um, so, so that's another one. And then the last one is what we call GCCM. That's called General Contractor Construction Manager. And um, uh, that's really a cost plus overhead and, and profit, uh, cost plus fixed fee. Uh, and um, it was put into place back in the early 2000s by the state of Washington to allow public entities to um, to be able to benefit from the involvement of a contractor early on and, um, and not have to go out to 
do the design bid build procurement method where you have lots of claims and lots of problems and it's just not it just that they found that it wasn't being very productive and very becoming very expensive for them so they put in gccm and that's used from time to time as well um, with design bid build back to estimating with design bid build contractors are going to do one estimate that's at the end of the design when they're when they're bidding competitively. The other the other three delivery methods there, you're going to do multiple estimates. You're going to do multiple estimates at the various design phases, and that um, and that is more desirable for contractors and certainly more beneficial for owners. So, those are the delivery methods that that contractors find themselves in right now. Um, there are different methods, but the estimating process is the same and the procedures are the same. And so uh, moving forward, we're gonna be talking about uh, the, the process of putting estimates together and how you do that. So what is estimating? Well, we could say it's rolling of the dice. You can throw a dart at a dartboard. You know, we've all been there where we've tried to understand what it means to estimate a project and I always say if you're if you're doing a lump sum bid, you want to be low, but you want to be right, and sometimes that those two don't often line up. So um, you have to be very careful in in how you put estimates together. So here's how here's what I say it is. I say I answer four questions or three questions. What do I have? What's the scope of the work that I'm estimating? Uh, it could be concrete. It could be steel. It could be wood framing, it could be sheetrock, it could be painting, whatever it might be. What do I have? What am I estimating? And then how much and how many do I have of, 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 of that work scope? And this is where you get into the QTO or the quantity takeoff and try to understand quantities. And everybody does QTOs. I'll show you an example here in a few minutes. But every day, everybody does QTOs on whatever they're estimating. Um, and then how much does each one cost? Whether it's a cubic yard of concrete or a square foot of paint or a lineal foot of wall or whatever it might be. Um, how much does each one cost? That's called the unit price. And how do you establish unit prices on the quantities that you've just put together? And, um, and then you add it all up and that's the recap. And of course, then you take all your recaps and put them together and you put on general conditions, which is what we're going to talk about in the next hour, and you put a fee on it and you turn it in and that's your estimate. So how do we do that and how do we get there and what's the process? So let's talk about that for a little bit. Um, there's a lot of moving parts and pieces in an estimate. Um, and um, a lot of it is self-performed work. A lot of it is getting subcontractors and materials suppliers to give you proposals and quotes. And so you need to be very careful and precise when you're putting together an estimate. Um, estimates usually take two to four weeks, depending on the project. Sometimes it's, it's maybe it's more than that. Uh, you know, if you look downtown Seattle right now, you see big, tall high rises going up and estimates have been prepared for those. And some of those estimates take four to six weeks to prepare and to do it properly. So lots of lots of um, care and precision go into preparing an estimate. So the first step that everybody has to ask themselves is, are we going to bid it or not? That's the question. And the questions you have to ask in order to answer that question are, are we capable of doing the project? The one thing that you don't want to do is to tackle an estimate and to tackle a project that you're not capable of doing. Will my workload allow the resources to do the job? If you're extremely busy, and in this marketplace right now, everybody is very busy. So they're very particular in what they look at and they're very particular in what they estimate. Um, so if you don't think you have the resources to do the job, then you shouldn't estimate the job. Why? Because, well, you, you can go broke being too busy. And, though, so you, and nobody wants that to happen. So. Uh, will our workload allow us to do the job and, and to, to prepare an estimate for the project? The quality or not of the competition. If you know who your competition is, it's important to know that. There's sometimes contractors are asked to prepare a courtesy bid. 
to show interest or maintain an existing relationship. You're, you're, you're very busy. You don't want to do the job. You're, you just don't have the resources, but a good client has asked you to put together an estimate. And so do you do that or don't you? There's a risk there. And the risk is that, um, well, you may, you may uh, give them a number that's not reliable and not very accurate. And what kind of message is, does that send? So you have to be careful uh, as to what you go after. And if somebody wants, to add, wants you to bid a job and you want to give them a courtesy bid, I would say, well, we're just too busy and we'd rather not and, and continue to maintain that relationship. And I think there's inherent risk in doing that. And then the last one is the bond requirements. Uh, as you all know, bonding is terribly, terribly important for all of us, all of you. If you lose your ability to bond a project, you're probably not going to be in the business very long. So, uh, the bond requirements are important. Are, do you have to require? Are they? Do you have to provide a bond or not? Um, and um, and if you do, then do you have the capacity to do it? And so, those are the questions that you want to ask yourself when you're getting ready to prepare a bid. And then. There are certain risks in, in trying to uh, understand if you should bid or not. Um, is the owner experienced? If you're a specialty sub, then you're going to have to to ask that question of the general contractor that you've been that has asked you to prepare a bid for something. Um, is the owner experienced or not? We would in my day we always wanted to work with experienced owners because they understand the process, they understand contracting. Um, is there appropriate financing for the job? You know, the one thing we don't want to do is to go and estimate a project and go after a job that isn't properly financed. Who is the construction manager? I work for a construction management firm. Vanner is a CM firm. We are not contractors. We're owners representatives. Uh, so is there a CM on the job? If so, who is it? Is it the architect or is it a consultant like us? Do they have a behavior history? What how are, how are they how are they to work with are they a good fit on on a team that you might be on and then what about the quality of the documents if you've all worked on projects before with bad documents in other words documents that aren't done uh, there's a big cost risk and it usually falls on the contractor uh, so uh, you want to make sure that you understand who the architect is do they have a reputation for quality documents and to make sure that you go in with your eyes open in terms of what what the documents are going to be like when you finally get to see them. Um, so those are some of the risks. Other risks are, is a schedule. You know, is it a realistic schedule or not? Um, uh, and usually, the your general conditions and the general conditions that we will um, that we will talk about uh, later on today um, <clears throat> will reflect the schedule that you see. And so uh, you have to understand the schedule if it's given to you. If you're a subcontractor and you're, and you're bidding to a general, you want to see their schedule. You want to understand it. How long do you think it's going to uh, take you to build the project and where do I fit in? Um, that's always very important to know before you embark on an estimate. And then li liquidated damages, or we call them LDs. You're all familiar with those. Uh, you want to make sure that, you know, if there are LDs in the contract or in the general conditions, you want to make sure that you, that you understand what they are. So those are risks. Um, let me see, are there other risks? Payment terms. Um, how are you going to get paid? Uh, what are the terms? Uh, what are the retention provisions? Uh, is it 10%? Is it 5%? Is it 10% to 50% and then zero? Uh, just what are the retention provisions in the contract that if you're a subcontractor, you'll be uh, you'll you'll be tied to. And then uh, what about the final payment and how long will it be after you're completed with your project? Will you get your final payment? All of those things is important to look at and to understand. Uh, let me see here. And then if you decide to bid. Yep, we've gone through all of that and we're going to decide. Yep, we're going to go after it. What's the plan to take it off and get it priced and be ready for bid day? Bid day is always something that we've all faced. It's usually two o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday. 
and uh, everybody has to look for that day at, when they have to turn in their bid. Um, so what is your plan? Your plan includes your schedule. How much time do you have? Do you have two weeks? Do you have four weeks? Do you have one week? Um, you may get asked by a contractor to give you a budget estimate that only you only have three or four days. So you have to understand how much time do I need? And then the personnel, who's gonna do what? You know, if you're a general contractor, you gotta quantify your self-performed work. You have to, well, we'll go through that in a minute, but you know, there's a lot of people that get involved in an estimate. So you have to understand who do I have available and who's gonna do what on the estimate. And then, or you could do it this way. You could do your estimate this way. And here's all ESOC and he needs, he's been asked, he needs his budget estimate today and we won't have useful numbers to next week. So it gives him a price of $3 million. And the guy says, okay, that guess that's good work. And um, I don't think you wanna do it this way, but, um, so I thought I'd th throw that in there just so you can get an idea of a little bit of humor here in this, uh, in, in, in our time today. So important to be prepared. What are the five Ps? Proper preparation prevents poor performance. I will tell you that if you're not prepared to put together an estimate and you're not organized and you're not doing it the same way every time, regardless of what kind of estimate you're preparing, um, uh, I think the performance is going to be very good. And um, I've been through it before. I'm sure a lot of you have been through it before. If you're not prepared, you won't be successful. So I want you to remember the five Ps of proper preparation prevents poor performance. Very important. So today, we're going to talk about what we call direct costs in, in, this, in this time together. Uh, the second half of the day will be an indirect cost, which is the general conditions, which we call indirect costs and then overhead and profit and markups, bonds, insurance, and taxes. But the first half is going to be labor, material, equipment, and subs. That's the, the primary uh, components of an estimate that you're going to prepare uh, is what we call the direct costs. And so there's pre-bid activities that you have to do to, to get organized. You have to get yourself organized to put a bid together. Um, you may wanna to advertise to the subcontracting community that you are bidding the job. You may wanna put bid documents on Builders Exchange or another site like that. Do you need a bid bond or not? If you need a bid bond, you better get one. I don't know if any of you have ever been gone to a bid opening and not had a bid bond in your envelope. Um, I will tell you that if you don't have a bid bond in your envelope and you're supposed to, they'll throw your bond away or their, your bid away. They won't even open it up. They won't even read it. I've been in that situation before and it's not much fun when you have to come back to your office and tell everybody that you didn't have the bid bond. Uh, you need to make sure that your bid bond, your bid form is prepared correctly. How many copies do you need? Is it properly signed and notarized? You need to review the insurance requirements. There's liability insurance that you, that you have to understand. And then there's builder's risk insurance. And builder's risk insurance may be provided by the owner. Generally it is, but at times it's provided by the contractor. And if the contractor has to provide it, then you need to know that you need to provide it. Builder's risk insurance is the insurance that the owner carries that insures the owner for the completed portion of the uncompleted project. So if you put in, if, if there's a fire or anything like that, the builder's risk policy will pay for the replacement uh, before the, the owner's uh, property insurance policy comes into effect after the building is, um, is completed. Uh, you have to review permits. Mostly the permits are the responsibility of the owner. Every now and then the contractor has to provide permits. There may be um, street use permits or things like that that you have to understand. And depending on which city you're in that's working, that you're working in, the permitting requirements may be different. Generally, the mechanical permit goes with the building permit and the electrical permit is provided by the electrical subcontractor. 
uh, sometimes that may change. So you just have to be aware of permits and, and who's providing the permits. The QTOs and the pricing for your self-performed work are critically important. Um, again, uh, we will talk about this in a little bit, but the, the self-performed work will be the greatest risk for a contractor. And so uh, if you're a, a general contractor and you're bidding a project, you have to go through and you have to estimate the concrete and the steel, any other work that you're self-performing. That may be doors and hardware, it may be toilet accessories, it may be miscellaneous steel. Uh, whatever your company self-performs, you have to quantify and you have to price. Um, and so that's always a critical item and usually takes the longest time. So you have to be out ahead of that. One thing that I tell my students in school is that you, they need to start sooner than later to get their concrete assignments done. And unfortunately, students these days um, have a hard time with time management. So uh, they're usually stand up for nights on end to get to get done, to get it done on time. So anyway, I'm sure none of you are like that. You're always well ahead of it. Uh, prepare the preliminary pr project schedule. This is usually the superintendent's job. And um, why do you want that? Well, because that's going to inform your general conditions. We will talk about that in the next hour. But general conditions, as you know, are a function of time. And um, so you need that project schedule in order to prepare your general conditions. Uh, you need to set up your bid day folders. You may have a special computer with estimating software on it that you have to um, that you have to get set up and ready to go. Uh, and you want to finalize what we call the first run estimate, or what we used to call the first run estimate, which is all of your self-performed work is done and priced. You all your general conditions are priced out. Your you have rough orders of magnitude for all your subs, and that you have a you have your add-ons all there. Uh, add-ons will probably change insurance and taxes probably won't, but the fee may. So you want to have all that done, uh, and you want to set up your bedroom and get organized. You're going to solicit personnel to take phone bids. Uh, you have to take your bids and you have to get them posted and you have to finalize your bid and turn it in. So that in a nutshell is everything you have to do before you bid the work, okay? So the process, the process is from bottom to top, you have to collect and request your information. You have to do your QTOs. You have to recap and combine all your QTO assemblies. You have to price it. You have to do your schedule. You have to finish your estimate your overall estimate, you have to get all your bids from your subcontractors and then you have to turn it in. So that's the process. So we're gonna go through that process right now and and um, and see where, where, we're, where we're headed here. So you wanna pay attention, uh, you wanna look at the invitation to bid, you wanna pay attention to the bid form. We talked about that a few minutes so we won't spend a lot of time on that. Uh, we talked about the bid bond. Uh, Alternates and unit prices are important. If you have alternates or unit prices that you have to provide either as a general or a sub, uh, you're gonna have to do separate estimates for those. So you need to make sure that you know if there's an alternate to add another floor or do this or whatever you need to do that you, um, that you are able to, to recognize that early and do separate estimates. Your team will, become, will be the chief estimator. He's gonna manage the whole thing. Some of you may have chief estimators in your firm, some not. Uh, he's, gonna, he's gonna do all the pricing and the summaries. Uh, you're gonna have an estimating staff that is gonna probably do your self-perform QTOs on all your concrete and steel and other items. You're gonna have a superintendent on your estimating team that's gonna do your schedule as well as your, as your productivity rates. I don't know how you estimate your labor, but we used to estimate by productivity rates. How many man hours? does it take to do something? Um, and uh, most contractors, that's how they estimate their labor these days is with productivity rates or unit man hours. Uh, th this is very important. You have to have a sub and a major supplier chaser. Um, Subcontracting uh, and major material suppliers will, will make up about 60% of the work on a typical commercial contracting uh, project. And so 
Uh, you have to make sure that they know that you want them to bid to you. You have to uh, know what subs you want to focus on. You have to get uh, your ROM estimates for the work. You have to be able to understand that and give put general numbers on those so you can compare actual bids to these. And you want to make sure that you have sufficient sufficient coverage. You know, um, if you only have one bid on sheetrock or one bid on mechanical electrical, that's not very good. So you want to make sure you have lots of coverage for subcontractors and major material suppliers. So then you got to collect and request your information. And where do you find that? Well, you're going to find it on the plans. You're going to find it in the specs, of course. You're going to look at the soils report very carefully. If you're a general contractor, you're going to want to know what that soils report says and how do you handle the, 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 the site? How do you handle excavation or under slab capillary breaks or anything like that? So the soils report is a critical piece of information when you're bidding a project. Any addenda that come out, you got to keep track of addenda. You may be, you may be required to do a pre-bid site visit. Um, uh, and if you're required to do that, you better go because if you don't, if it's required, then uh, you need to be there or they may disqualify you. Bid requirements are, um, yeah, just understand what the bid requirements are and then you may, you may know who your competition is. If you go to a site visit, you'll probably know who you're bidding against and that may influence how you bid it or how aggressive you are or what kind of fee you might put on it or not. So. Anyway, um, so here's the QTO. We talked about the QTOs. QTO is usually for self-perform work, okay? And, and it's the biggest risk for a contractor. Why is it? Because it represents anywhere between 20 and 30% of an estimate. And then if you put labor burden on that, then it can be anywhere from 30 to 40% of an estimate, depending on how much of the, of the work you're going to self-perform. Generally, you're going to self-perform concrete and earthwork and miscellaneous steel, doors and hardware, toilet accessories, any site work perhaps, or anything else that you, your company self-performs, you're going to have to do a QTO on. And this, this is an example of a QTO for some, uh, for some uh, concrete work. And um, it's very um, precise. It's very neat and organized. And I teach my kids at school that you got to have one of these for every piece of scope of work that you're going to self-perform. And sometimes they go one or two pages. In this particular case, it happens to be spread footings and it's six line items. But um, still, it has to be done the same way every time. I would encourage you all, if you don't do that, to make sure that your QTOs, your quantity takeoff processes and procedures are done the same way every time. Um, and I, I, I tell my kids it's, it should tell a story and anybody can pick it up and, and understand it and know what you've done. So the QTO is critically important. And then from the QTO, you usually go to a pricing recap. And again, um, there's the pricing recap. If you look at the spread footings up there, 213 yards and you go over here down to the lower section of that, you'll see the recap for spread footings. And so again, um, not sure how many of you are general contractors. Um, if you're painters or sheetrockers, you may not care about spread footings, but um, that's the process that you would go through to take your quantities that you've quantified and you move them over to the recap sheet where you price them. And, uh, and again, uh, it's just for your self-perform work. Uh, you may have databases that you price work from, or you may use RS Means or some other um, uh, resource like that. And again, it's the largest risk for the general contractor. Labor is the largest risk. So if you don't have the labor right, then uh, chances are that, that you're either not gonna be a low bidder or you're gonna really struggle on the job because you you can't stop paying your your carpenters and laborers and everybody else when you run out of money like you know it's not like a subcontract um, you have to pay them until they get the work done and if the labor isn't correct then you got a problem so again biggest risk pays to do it very thoughtfully and carefully larry I, we have a question coming through yep. 
Yep, go ahead. Um, with the commodity price with steel and lumber going up on the, I don't know, daily basis, yep. how would you in your proposal or, or estimate uh, kind of hedge against that? Well, um, if if you're if you're bidding a if, if you're bidding a job competitively in a design bid build situation, um, you're probably going to have to take the 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 estimate that you have, the quotation that you have, and uh, make sure that that your owner knows that this is what you've done. It, it's a little bit of a risk because you 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 generally can't amend a, a bidding you know uh, a, a, a bid by telling them that um, you've you're using this price for lumber or steel or rebar or whatever it might be another way to do that is to put in an allowance especially on a negotiated job where you have an opportunity to talk to your client and if your client is an owner then fine if your client is a general contractor then that's fine too but you can always put in an allowance and most owners and contractors these days are very aware of the commodity market and the fact that you know everything is moving around at a pretty quick pace. So I would suggest either an allowance or or a narrative that would somehow protect you against some major swings or or uh, or or even be open book and say here's what I've used and here's my price and things like that. It, it it's tough right now, um, and I've heard from from generals that you know. You can have swings of 20 to 30 percent in a week, so it's not a comfortable market to be in. And and um, but I would suggest either the allowance, or or the narrative or a, a qualifications or an assumptions page. And, um, and but the best thing is to be able to sit down and talk to your client about that and make sure that they understand the assumptions you've made. Thank you. You bet. Uh, so that so yeah that was a good question um, you know and, and of course escalation is always something that contractors have to worry about because a lot of times contractors will um, will give an owner a price in today's dollars whatever today's dollars mean and the job may not start for 18 months right or a year or something like that and so contractors always have to put escalation factors in. I think that right now construction escalation is around 4% annually. And you can probably take commodities out of that for a, for, a, for a minute because they're driving it one way or the other. But contractors always have to think about that at the end of the day when they put their estimate together and they mark it up and then they got this blank line called escalation. Well, what's it going to cost me to build this a year from now? Do I put 4% on it? Do I tell my client that it's in today's dollars? And that I've excluded escalation. I'm not sure that's the right answer, but that's the $64 question: is what do you do with construction escalation? Um, recently, it's been five or six percent. It's been crazy out there. You've all driven through Seattle. You've seen all the tower cranes up. You know, it's it's booming. Uh, I in my career, I've seen escalation as a negative number, where it will cost you less a year from now than it does today because the market was so down back in the mid you know eight, eight nine and ten of 2000 um, that, that, that that's the way it was so it's um, it's um, uh, it, it's a big question and a very good good question so back to the pricing recap that's the next step is pricing recap um, then you have a project summary schedule that you have to do and have to prepare um, if you're a general contractor, the superintendent is going to do this. At least my superintendents always did it because it would be their schedule. And again, it informs your general conditions. We'll talk about that next hour, but general conditions are generally time-based, months, weeks, et cetera. So how long is it going to take me to do the job? And then a lot of times subs will ask you for the schedule, either ask you for input on how long do you have in for my work or send me the schedule i'd like to look at it so um, really important that you have a, a schedule that you can use when you're um when you're bidding a job and putting an estimate together say so now we're going to go to the subcontractor and supplier bids as i mentioned before oh 60 65 percent of your job is coming from sub bids 
and all of you have an, a, a bid proposal from subs that usually some you take over the phone. I, I don't know, you may still get faxes on email, but this is an example of a, of a bid proposal that somebody uh, would take over the telephone. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, um, and then you have to have a recap sheet, a bid recap sheet, we call this, as you can see this, this is what Lise Crutcher Lewis used to use. Um, so I don't tell anybody I use their, their, their form today, but um, um, there's a lot of different ways to gather sub bids, okay? This happens to be one way. Um, I always said that you needed um, a one of these for every subcontract bid that you're going to get. So if you anticipate that you're going to get 30 or 40 work scopes that you're going to get subcontractor or supplier bids from, you need to have one of these for every one of those, okay? And um, so if we go back to the bid form, but it's filled out now, um, somebody in your office is going to take phone bids. And this is what it's going to look like at the end of the day. And it's filled in completely and it has a spec section on it. And of course it has the price on it. Uh, if you have any exclusions or alternates of unit prices, you have to understand that. Is it furnished only or is it furnished and installed? Is it FOB job site? Is it FOB warehouse? All of those things are on the bid form. And then this bid form is delivered immediately to the bid room as soon as you can get it there. So somebody else can do this. And that's what they're gonna do is they're gonna take this bid from F and B drywall and they're gonna put it on this bid recap sheet. And again, it's one recap for each work scope. So this happens to be for drywall. As you can see at the top, there's probably room for eight bids, okay? And if you'll notice on the left-hand side of that, that bid recap, there is a description of the work. It has the project name. It has the spec sections that is incorporated on this bid, re bid recap. And it has different questions that need to be asked of each bidder. And it has any alternates that you may have that need to be posted as well. In this particular case, prior to the bid day, prior to the night before, this drywall is estimated at 100 and whatever that is, $135,000, okay? That was somebody saying, yep, I'm gonna plug $135,000 in for drywall. Now I'm gonna get my bids. I'm gonna get my bids from every, from every sub that comes in and you're gonna get them You'll get some the night before. You're going to get some the day of. If you have a two o'clock bid opening, you're going to get bids starting at seven or eight o'clock in the morning. And you have to post them to each one of these sheets. And every time you get a low bid, you have to cross out one and circle the next one or a, or a different bid. I shouldn't say a low bid. I should say a different bid because you may get a higher bid. Maybe my ROM estimate is too low. So you have to get to the number that you need that's the right number. So you're gonna go back and forth and you don't need to update it at the end of every, um, at the end of every, uh, every time you get a bid, but periodically during the day, you need to update it. So now you're, you're current, you know what number you're using, okay? And um, again, this is very organized, it's very sequential. Uh, you're in a bid room, which is a special room all by itself, just to put bids together. And only one or two people are going to touch the, these things, okay? You can't ever have everybody look at everybody participating in this. Just one or two are going to be in there managing this process. Of course, you know, the, 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 the executives of the world can come in and pick up something and look at that and say, how many drywall bids do you have? And who are they? Because they're usually stapled their paperclip to the back and they can look at them and they can get an idea uh, of, of, of how many bids you're getting and uh, they're evaluating risk at that point, okay? So then you, you, you end up coming to this form and this is one form of a final estimate or bid. And you can see that all of this self-perform work has been filled in at the top. Um, 
If you have any other information that you need to fill in below, you can. All of your labor burden is in there. If you have taxes and insurance, you're gonna have those in there as well. Your general conditions are priced and it's filled out the night before. So the night before your bid, if you're bidding on Tuesday at two o'clock by Monday night, this form is done. It is all done and the yellow box is the only thing that is left to be adjusted. And this process that I just showed you informs the yellow box. And again, there's a lot of different ways to do this. There's a lot of different ways to adjust your bids. Some companies have a, a bid computer that does nothing but adjust bids back and forth. And you just keep adjusting the number in the yellow box up or down, and that is your final bid. And that's, that's, that's how they usually do it. But again, it can be done in a variety of different ways. And I'm sure a lot of you do it differently than this, but this is just one example. The key here is it's done the night before because your, your bid day is focused on evaluating subcontractor bids. Everything else is behind you. So, um, so, that's the, um, so that's generally the process that you go through um, when, you, when you follow up, now you're done, okay? You're all done with your bid and you've turned it in and you're either low bidder or you're not but you're gonna go back through and you're gonna follow up um, on, um, uh, you're gonna have some standard estimating checklists or forms that you're gonna go through and you're gonna check off. Um, most everybody will record jobs, job costs differently, but their estimating systems are, are formatted to record job costs. So in the event that you're low bidder or you're successful, now you're gonna take your estimate and you're going to transfer it to a system that will allow you to track your cost during the course of construction. Okay. And so you need to be able to have everything all kind of consistent and everything is ready to go um, in the event that you get, get the work. You want to debrief, debrief on both successful and unsuccessful bids. Um, you know, I've been low bidder by a lot. That's not a good feeling because then you want to go back and see what happened. What did I leave out? Did I make a mistake? Um, if you're not successful, then could I have done anything differently? Did I get any bids in late? Did I make the right evaluation on my subcontractor bids? Um, and was my process correct? Um, we always used to go back and look at the process and how did it go? Could we have done anything differently that it would improve the process? Um, so it's really, really important to do that right away um, so that you can um, uh, so that you can put though into practice the next time any lessons learned that you might have. And then, you know, we kept our stuff, you know, if, if you have a file system or it's most it's electronic now, I'm sure um, um, you got to keep them so you can refer to them on future bids, uh, similar bids. Uh, or not, um, you know, again, it's just really important that you take the time right away to go through certain checklists and, and make sure that you understand either what you did right or what you could improve on or anything like that. Um, and then, I don't think you want me to explain all of that over again, but um, again, a little, uh, a little humor. I can't see any head tilt, so I'm presuming that everybody's not tilting their head and say, what in the world did he talk about? But anyway, so that's kind of where we are right now. We're kind of right up to almost five minutes to one. So um, Leslie, any questions that are out there that we could, we could refer to right now? Um, um, not that I see. I, um, let's give it a minute for people to uh, um, jot down their questions. And while we're waiting for that though, um, I'm going to ask Jessica to go ahead and uh, put up poll number one. And, and, and I would ask if anybody has a question that they want to ask me right now, just, you know, unmute yourself and ask away. I don't have a problem with that at all. Okay, perfect. Uh, Larry, we do have a question that 
came through the chat. Um, so the question is between the bid process and the accounting for your business, is there a given percentage that a company should allow for change orders and other unexpected alterations? Um, are you talking about on the owner's side or the contractor's side? Uh, if, if, uh, Hi, Larry, this is Andrew. I the one that yeah. brought the question. Sure. Uh, my father worked in construction for a really long time and his biggest headache was they'd get a last minute change order because they needed these glass doors instead of those steel ones and just alterations like that. And what I'm looking at is the, uh, from the general's point of view, when you know you're going to have to fulfill these change orders at some point, is it generally like a 20% of what the bid or the estimate was, or is it like 50%? Uh, is there kind of a standard there at all, or is it all just by the hip? Well, I, good question, Andrew. What, what I tell my clients, because one of the things that we do is we try to manage not only the construction costs, and we've been talking about construction costs today, but certainly there's, you know, 30% of a budget is made up of soft costs. And one of those is owner's contingency. And so we always tell clients that you should allow 5% of your construction budget for unanticipated costs that relative to RFIs, costs associated with answers to RFIs or any changes that the client might want to make. Um, you know, I always encourage owners to make sure that the documents that you start with, um, that you start the construction process with, are truly reflect the scope of the work that you that you uh, that you want. Now, there's always going to be things that happen, like you described, that are going to um, that are going to cause change orders, and change orders are inevitable. You'd like to have fewer than more, of course. You would like to have less RFIs than more. Because um, that's where a lot of the cost comes is answers to RFIs, and that's really a function of the quality of the documents. But I would say five percent for now, and, and I would ask the owner to carry that, not the contractor. The contractor will carry construction contingency for themselves, uh, not in a lump sum bid scenario because they can't be low bidder if they have contingency buried in there. But on a negotiated job, they're going to carry eh, three, two to three percent for unanticipated conditions or buyout things or whatever. But yeah, I would say 5% on the owner's side. Um, Larry, I don't know much about the design built uh, yeah. contract, but yeah. there seems to be a number of them. Uh, there seems to be a trend of leaning towards that type of contracting. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean that if I bid for a design build project, I carry as a contractor more risks? You, as a design build contractor, first of all, you will hire the designer, okay? In a traditional, in a traditional procurement method, and let's compare it to negotiated guaranteed maximum price for right now, the owner would carry the, or he would hire the architect the owner would also hire the contractor. So he's responsible contractually for the performance of the designer and all of his design team members. In a, in a design build pr procurement method, the contractor hires the architect. So the owner only has one agreement and that's with the contractor. Contractor hires the designer and then so the contractor is now responsible for the designer and what they do or what they don't do. So if there's an RFI on you should have done this and you did that or this isn't done or whatever, the contractor is responsible for that. So contractors have more risk, yes, but they also carry more contingency. So that 5% contingency that I, that I just mentioned to Andrew a lot of that would come over to the contractor's side and they would carry that in their construction contract because they are now responsible for any costs, any change orders that result as from answers to RFIs or incomplete documents or the documents that haven't been coordinated. The only change orders that they're not responsible for is the changes that the owner makes uh, that changes the scope of the work. So yes, more risk, certainly for contractors, but 
they also carry more contingency that the owner would carry otherwise. Does that mean that you could potentially, your risk could potentially outweigh by your profit for design build projects? No, your, I mean, your, your fees are gonna be a little higher on design build projects. Um, because again, your your value is more because you know in the you know if you say that design fees for for normal projects are ten percent, you're going to take that ten percent and you're going to put that into your construction contract. So you're going to carry it. So your fees are going to be higher, and your percentages are going to be a little higher. If you thought that the risk was going to, you know, erode your your um, your fee, then you probably shouldn't be in the design build world. Uh, you probably shouldn't pursue a design build project. Um, I don't know if that answered your question or not, but uh, you know, fees are usually, you know, if your cost is correct, and again, this, your, your, your fee is gonna be based on labor. How much labor do I have and what's my risk? And, and, if, and if I'm comfortable with my labor and I'm comfortable with my cost and in a design build market, and if I'm comfortable with my partner, the designer, and the structural engineer and the mechanical engineer and the electrical engineer and the soils guy and the civil and everybody, because they're your, they're your consultants now, not the owners. If you're comfortable with all of that, then you're entitled to make a reasonable fee. And these are usually negotiated agreements. And so you have the chance to talk to your client about that. But the fees are generally a little higher on a percentage basis. And um, uh, and but the key is, are you comfortable with the cost of the work as you've quantified it, priced it, and put it together? Thank you. You bet. Good stuff. So, Larry, if I might throw out one more question. Sure. That's all right. Thank you sure. for a good answer on the last one, by the way. Um, when you're calculating in your labor expenses, is there a set amount of labor costs you put aside to contingent a thing like a bad inspection or employees that are getting injured on the job? Is there a certain amount of labor costs that you just add consistently to every bid to deal with those types of contingencies? If you're, if you're bidding lump sum, low bid lump sum, you probably can't afford to do that. If you're if you're negotiating a project with a client, um, a lot of times contractors will put in what we call estimating contingency, and that may be one or two percent that are for this particular purpose of what you described, Andrew, of of those un, unanticipated things that happen that you don't anticipate um, the you know, if a, if a, if you're just losing money on labor because you didn't estimate it properly in the first place, that's one thing. But if there's, you know, crazy adverse weather or anything like that, that's, that's affecting your labor productivity, then owners have been pretty open to being able to allow that to be used. With labor contingent, with estimating contingency, however, you need the owner's permission to use it. Okay. And Thank chances you. are, if you don't use it, you're going to return it to them. So it, it's really, I call it fee protection, right? Um, you know, contractors are in this business to make money. What can I do to, to mitigate risk and to protect my fee? Estimated contingency is one of those. Most owners are open to it. Some, nah, it's on you, a general contractor. Now you're gonna to start to bump your productivity rates a little bit if you think you can, but I've never been a fan of that because I think you just, and especially if you're open book, you wanna be straight across up front with them, open book, here's what I've done, nothing to hide, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. You bet. <clears throat> So, Larry, this is Leslie. Um, quick question in regards to um, any federal projects that you might have worked on or federal funded projects. Um, do all these same rules apply or is this strictly on the commercial side? No, um, on projects where you have 
uh, public money, let's say, or, or uh, uh, like schools or universities or other projects. Uh, I haven't done a federal project in a long time, um, but on where where public money is is used for financing, then you have to get permission from um, what they call the CPARB uh, in Olympia, and you have to go through the project review committee uh, to get permission from the state or the governing agency in order to use an alternative contracting method. Um, uh, generally, if you're, and in years past, um, uh, you know, public money jobs have been competitively bid. Lump sum, low bidder gets it, right? You got to keep the competition there. Um, and and that, had, that was a problem in years past with claims and, and schedules that were way out of whack and it, it was a mess. So as I mentioned earlier, this, the state of Washington put in an RCW back in 2002 or 2003, which allowed for the GCCM which allowed for the same kind of, of competition. It allowed for the contractor to be hired early in the process. They competed on fee and they competed on general conditions, which we'll talk about in the next hour. Um, and, and then the contractor had to bid everything. And it was an open bid, just like lump sum bid was. The, the only difference is that the contractor had to, had to bid his own work. He had to competitively bid his self-performed work. So you could just couldn't go do the concrete. You had to bid the concrete against your friendly competitors. And if you were low bidder, great. If you weren't low bidder, you know, Sullen would have to write a contra subcontract to Lee Crutcher Lewis to do the, the concrete on their job if they weren't low bidder. So that kept the competition in it. Okay. And that, that was the purpose of the RCW. In design bid build, again, because it's an alternative contracting method, you still have to go through that process to, to be approved by the state uh, in order to use that. You have to have certain, there are certain criteria that you have to present uh, to the PRC, Project Review Committee, that they approve it or they don't. Uh, I'm not that familiar with federally funded projects as I am with private or publicly funded projects in the state. Thank you. You bet. Okay, well, thank you again. And I hope that the, I hope I don't have many hill, head tilts uh, left. I, I, um, um, I, I couldn't see any, any faces or nods or scowls or anything like that, but I, I trust that the hour that we just spent was helpful and useful. And, um, and I will tell you that if any of you ever have any other questions for me that you think of afterwards, you can certainly send those through Leslie or Jessica, and they can get them to me, or I'm happy to share my, my email if you'd like to ask me directly. So any, anyway, um, so second half of the, of the class today, if I guess we call it a class, is on bid markups. We've just been through cost, and we've just been through what we call direct cost. And you've done a great job of, of quantifying and estimating your direct costs of evaluating your subcontractors and got your labor productivity correct and you got all the stuff that you need to, to understand the cost of your job. And now we're gonna go into markups. We'll do general conditions at the end, but we're gonna do markups now. And, and markups are what we call below the line, as you know. And there are six or seven that we wanna talk about today that are important to understand um, and um, and so I want to go through each one of them separately. And, um, and again, if you have questions, um, you know, raise your hand or send in a chat or whatever, and we'll be happy to answer them as best we can. So from a markup standpoint, we're going to talk about seven. We're going to talk about labor burden, um, uh, bonds, general liability insurance, state and city b &O tax, or more commonly referred to as excise tax, builder's risk insurance, Washington state sales tax, and fee. All right. So... So labor burden, labor burden, everybody knows what labor burden is because we have to pay it for our, on behalf of our employees, which is FICA, FUTA and SUTA, and which is unemployment insurance and Medicare and social security and workman's comp and 
if you're a union contractor, you're you're paying union dues and benefits on their behalf. Um, there is, I think, there's a there's a difference between salaried and craft. I always say that, and again, I'm coming at you to you today from the union contractor's perspective. Okay, I was born and raised working for union contractors, but for salaried personnel, I always say that labor burden for salaried personnel that would would be about 35 percent of their labor dollar uh craft trades are 54 percent and iron workers can be pushing 71 percent uh because of the of the various um uh union requirements and benefits that they get so 35 54 and 71 that's what i teach my 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 class uh that they have to keep track of their general conditions separately from a labor standpoint because that's where your salaried people live is in your general conditions so anyway labor burden is is um is a big deal to to remember and to get correct certainly if your labor is right then your burden should be right if you're using the appropriate percentages um so um and again, if you have any questions, let me know. But um, uh, labor burden is always the first thing that we calculate after we understand what our labor exposure is. Second one is bonds. And bonds are, are um, uh, sometimes they're needed, sometimes they're not, depending on the job, depending on the client, depending on your relationship with your client. A performance bond, uh, and usually you get a performance and payment bond together, but the performance bond guarantees the contractor's performance on the job, guarantees that uh, he will perform the work that he's he's contractually obligated to, to perform based on the documents that he has. And the payment bond, part of the bond, uh, guarantees that the contractor makes his, pays his ob for his obligations. And that means his all of his labor and his subcontracts and his material suppliers and his union trust funds benefits and everything like that. That's what the performance and payment bond does. The rates will vary depending on the size of the project, depending on the contractor. Generally, um, rates will go from 0.65% to 1.5%. All right, and, um, and again, Sometimes bonds are required on public jobs, uh, probably so for the most part, uh, on private work. I mean, if you're a contractor and you're working for Amazon or Microsoft, chances are you're not going to be required to, um, pro to provide a bond. The bond will, will validates and verifies your financial capability to build the project. And, and there are times when lenders will require it just because that's the way lenders are. They want to know that you're financially sound and stable. And so they will require you to perform, to provide a bond. And, um, uh, you know, we always, we always tried to talk our clients out of the bond because they didn't need it. And if the bond was, was needed, we would um, send the, bo the bond premium directly to the client without running it through our books. So we got to mark it up and do all those things and let them pay the bonding company directly. So it's, um, it's one of those things that we tried to stay away from if we could. Having said that, you need to have the bonding capacity in case you need it. And if you lose your bonding capacity, then you're probably out of business in, this, in, the, in the construction industry. I put in here, in here bonding Washington state sales tax because a lot of times contractors will forget to include sales tax in their bond premium. And what that means is that, that, and we'll talk about tax in a little bit, but normally construction contracts do not include Washington state sales tax in them. Sales tax is added on to the pay, pay application on a monthly basis. And the owners pay the contractors for the sales tax that way rather than having it in in the in in the contract okay um the owner is not obligated to pay the sales tax to the state the owner is obligated to pay the sales tax to the contractor and the contractor is obligated to pay the sales tax to the state and of course the sales tax is based on revenue so if 
the, the, the contract amount has sales tax in it, then you're double dipping on the sales tax. So you keep sales tax out of contracts and you, um, uh, and back to the payment bond, the, the, the payment bond guarantees the, the contractor's obligations. And the contractor is, is obligated to pay the state of Washington their share of sales tax as he is to pay the subcontractor for the work that they performed on the job. So what we always did and what I teach my class to do is you take a contract amount, pay 10 million bucks, you add sales tax to it of 10%. So now I get $11 million and I calculate my bond premium on the $11 million. So in the unlikely and unfortunate event that you got to make a claim against the contractor's bond, they, the bonding company will then be obligated to pay the sales tax. So that's how that works, okay? The bid bond, uh, most everybody should know what a bid bond is. Um, if I could um, ask you the question, I would, but then you'd have to unmute and that would get too confusing. So a bid bond guarantees the low bid against default. A bid bond is um, something that you turn in with a bid. Generally, there is no charge for the bid bond. The consequences are pretty severe if you forget it, like I told you earlier on. Um, so, um, so if the low bidder defaults for any reason, the client can make a claim against the bond. They're usually in the amount of 5% of the bid and they can go to the second bidder and the bonding company would make up the difference. In all of my years, I have never had anybody make a claim against a bid bond. Uh, having said that, most lump sum bids on a design bid build basis will require a bid bond. So my encouragement to all of you, if you don't, if you don't know already, don't forget the bid bond. So let's see here. Now we have taxes and insurance. <clears throat> taxes and insurance are something that has to be added on. Um, again, these are based on total contract amount. So the state is, it has a constant rate for the B&O tax or the excise tax. And that's 4.471%, okay, for the state of Washington on the retail rate. There are two components to BO tax. One is for the state. We just talked about that, 0.471. Uh, the cities will vary. I will get this wrong, but I think Seattle is 0.215%. I think Bellevue is 0.1 something. I know that Burien has zero because I've done work in Burien and they have zero excise tax. So estimators need to know what the tax rate, the excise tax rate is for the city that the project is being built in, not where your office is, but where the project is being built in, all right? And again, these, these taxes are based on revenue. So <clears throat> you have to calculate the tax rate, or the, the tax, on the, the, the bottom line contract amount or your estimate total. And of course, you've all dealt with circular references on Excel, so you gotta understand how to undo that. But so it, it will constantly update itself by calculating on itself to, I don't know how many places, 100, I think, or whatever it does, and then it stops. But anyway, so B&O tax, constant for the state, it varies by the city, and you will have to calculate it on your, um, on your bid amount or your estimate total. The contractor's liability insurance is um, sometimes PLPD, personal liability and property damage. And that will be generally about 1%. I've seen them as low as 0 0.7, 0 0.75. Again, it's a function of safety. Uh, and um, so, EMR and all that, all that good stuff that you all know about. So you need to, that's just how it's calculated. And again, like city b &O, it's calculated on revenue. So it's calculated on your bottom line on, on uh, total, including your fee and everything else. The builder's risk insurance policy is a little different. Um, whereas the contractor's liability insurance insures the contractor and the owner is a named insured on the policy. The builder's risk policy insures the owner with the contractor named as a named insured. 
And what the builder's risk policy does is it, it's insurance for the completed portions of the uncompleted project. Um, so if, um, you know, if you're halfway done on a $15 million job, uh, technically you've, you've, you've insured seven and a half million dollars worth of the work because you've, the owner has essentially bought and paid for 50% of the work. So he, te he technically owns it, but he's not insured for it yet because he, the building is probably not included on his, on his uh, uh, the property policy yet. So that's where the builder's risk insurance comes in. And generally owners will take it out <clears throat> and get it through their own insurance carrier. There are times when contractors can get the builder's risk policy themselves cheaper than the owner can, and that's fine. Um, then uh, they can get it and, and they can include it in their estimate. But again, back to the, back to the, the first class that, that we had this morning, um, uh, you need to know if builder's risk is a, is a requirement of you or not, or the owner is gonna take care of it. You gotta go look for it. Uh, generally 0 0.35, 0 0.4%, ish, maybe sometimes less, sometimes more, depending. But that's generally where the premium amounts will be uh, on builder's risk, OK? <clears throat> Here's an interesting one that I don't know that any, some of you have heard about yet. It's called SDI, Subcontractor Default Insurance. It's relatively new in the industry that general contractors carry. Um, as a replacement for a bond that they might be required to get. It does not replace the, their liability policy, but, it, re, but it, it, it defaults and it protects against subcontractor default is what it does. Um, the SDI policy will require that all participants, all subs, are participate in this. It's kind of like a wraparound where everybody jumps on and, and everybody's insured. If a subcontractor cannot be, be a part of the SDI policy for whatever reason, and it's usually financial, then the sub is required by the general to be bonded. And if the subcontractor cannot be bonded, then the subcontractor is disqualified and they have to go to somebody else. So it's one policy. It ensures the performance of the subs and it's about one to 1.2% of the cost of the work, okay? But that's relatively new and I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it or, or, or included in any of your estimates, but generally a subcontractor, or general contractors today will include an SDI policy. Um, especially if they need to be bonded because it will replace the bond. It usually does. Uh, again, we've talked about sales tax a little bit, um, rarely included in a general contractor's estimate um, and paid separately by the owner on a, on a monthly basis. Um, Larry, sorry about interrupting. So for the SDI, um, that would be something a con subcontractor would pay for the GC? No, no, the subcontractor is, is a part of the policy and the owner pays the general contractor. The subcontractor has no cost obligation on SDI. The only requirement is the subcontractor participate. So if you're a subcontractor and you're, and you're bidding to, to, on a job, you would probably wanna ask the general if there's going to be a requirement for subcontractor default insurance. And if he says yes, then you're going to have to participate. In other words, be named on the policy and the, and the insurance carrier would probably want to jump into your financials a little bit to understand how financially solvent or capable you are and or you can provide a bond. But that's between the, you and the general contractor, but not the client. The client pays the premium on SDI but the subcontractor does not. And that's so how I understand it. If the subcontractor has its own surety bond and that would be yep. okay in yep. that case. Yep. That's right, to the, to the general. Okay. So, um, 
So fee, let's talk about fee a little bit. Fee is um, can be all over the board. I remember bidding work back in the 2007-8 timeframe, zero fee. Add it all up, put on your taxes and insurance, everything else fee, zero. Why zero? Well, because um, one, you need the work. And two, more importantly, you wanna keep your good people busy. So um, yeah, fee is back and forth. A lot of it depends on the market and the conditions in the backlog. If you have a busy market, a busy, busy market and a large backlog, uh, chances are your fees are gonna be higher. And if you have, you're in a, a down market and your backlog is you know, next to nothing, then your fees are gonna be lower. Um, back in, the two, in, in 2007 and eight, um, a lot of companies got caught with no backlog because they didn't have any work under contract. They had work coming up, but they didn't have any work under contract. And so they got stuck by that because a lot of owners canceled their, their or delayed their projects. So um, uh, it's, um, uh, it's uh, a, a big deal in a busy market and it's a big deal in a down market. So it's a, always, always interesting to have those conversations. Um, and um, it, uh, it generally, I would say what the last job I'm doing right now is um, the contractor's fee was 3.75% um, on a $35 million contract. So, um, and I, I'm also working on a, on a, on a GCCM project uh, for a high school and that fee is less than three. So you can tell that uh, contractors are still being aggressive these days with respect to fee. Two components of fee, main office overhead and profit. That's fairly straightforward. Uh, fee is sometimes a function of direct labor. Um, Cause as we talked about before, uh, the, the direct labor is the contractor's biggest risk. So uh, they, will, they will look at how much is subcontracted out versus how much they're self-performing and more labor, labor will probably equal a higher fee. Um, and, um, and again, you know, there's, there's times when you say, well, my, my fee wants to be 50% of my labor exposure. And a lot of folks look at it that way. That's not necessarily what they do, but they look at it in, in terms of what's my labor risk and what's my labor exposure. And again, you, you wanna protect against that if you can. What does the fee pay for? Well, the fee pays for, in addition to overhead, it'll pay for bonus pool, if any. It'll pay for profit sharing, if any. And it will pay for the contri contributions to ESOP. If any of you are familiar with ESOP, Employee Stock Ownership Plan, uh, a lot of companies are owned by their employees, or at least partially owned by their employees. And so, any contributions, and that can be a whole different conversation for another day, but any, any contributions would come out of fee. Rarely have I ever seen any kind of bonus pool or profit sharing come out of cost if there's any savings or anything like that. And we could, we could talk about shared savings uh, at some other time as well. I mean, there's all sorts of things that go into this, um, but that's what fee pays for. And again, three to 5% de depending on on, on the job and the length of the job and labor exposure and the time of the year and and the market and all those things. That's generally where it's at. So anyway, um, so um, let's talk a little bit about contingency. Contingency is something that you will find not on a design bid build bid estimate but you will find contingency as a component of any other estimate that you do either in a negotiated project or a GCCM project or a design build project. You will have lines for contingency. So let's talk a little bit about it. You know, it's a stipulated sum added to the bottom line to cover unresolved design issues, additional scope, escalation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
And so let's talk a little bit about what those kinds of contingencies are. The first one is design contingency. If you're working on a guaranteed maximum price project and you've been selected to be on the job and, and the architect is halfway through um, um, design development or whatever, you're going to be preparing estimates at three stages in that project. You're going to prepare an estimate at the schematic design stage, at the design development stage, and at the construction document stage. And the design contingency is there in the early stages and all the way through to account for the design that you don't know about. So as the design progressive the progresses, the contingency comes down. So at the schematic design stage, the architect says, I am done with schematic design. Mr. Contractor, I want you to estimate this job for me. And my, my estimating guy is going to estimate it. And we're going to come together and reconcile. So you're going to go through the whole process that we just talked about, uh, although with probably not as many subs because you won't have enough documentation to give to subs. But you're going to come up with a number. And then you're going to say, what's my design contingency? What am I going to put in there that that allows me to be covered on the, what my architect friend is going to do that I don't know about yet. And I say that between seven and 10% is what schematic design is going to uh, require at, at that point. So if you're at a four, you're doing a $40 million job, you got 4 million bucks in there for stuff you don't know about, right? So now the architect and that, and you're at about third, 25 to 30% done with design and schematic. At design development, now you're about 75% done, three months down the road, four months, five months, whatever. And now you're going to be asked to do another estimate, full-blown estimate. I would say a good estimate on a major construction job is 50 to 75,000 bucks to do it right. So now you're going to do another one. Now what's my design, what's my design contingency? I know more. He's, he's drawn a lot more than he had at schematic design. It's 5% now. He's still not done, or he's done with the scope, but he's not done fussing with it and on all the details. So 5%. So now you go through and you finish the CDs. You're going to sign a guarantee maximum price based on this estimate, construction document estimate, and you're going to put in zero because the job, the, the design is done and you, there's nothing more to design. You, he is complete. So Seven to ten percent at schematic, five percent on design development, and zero at construction documents. Three separate estimates with different levels of design contingency. The estimating contingency. We talked about this a little bit. Um, it allows for estimating errors. It could be one to two percent. Most owners will allow it. Some won't, and you need to be able to um, defend it if you're going to use it. Uh, you have to take it and you have to move it up into your estimate, into your labor dollars, and uh, your owner has to approve that based on why. The real question is, why do you want to use it, Mr. Contractor? But we called it fee protection, didn't we? So that's another contingency. Construction or buyout contingency. Most, all, all the contractors or most, the, most of the contractors now are including construction contingency in their guarantee maximum price estimates or in their GCCM estimates, okay? And um, it's, again, the owner must approve for use. And if it's not used, it could be, it's returned 100% to the owner. It does not go into what we call job costs where it's subject to savings if there are any, if there's shared savings provisions in your contract. It goes 100% back to the owner. And it can be used for a variety of different things. Uh, it can be used for unforeseen conditions. It can be used for any subcontractor issues, or it can be used for overtime if you need it, or any other reason that the general contractor may request. The key there is request. He can't just use it, and the owner has to approve it. Again, it's not used in design bid build projects. Why? Because if you put in two to three percent construction contingency in your um, in your bid, you're probably not going to be low bidder. And um, uh, that's the whole idea of bidding a job is to be low bidder. So uh, it's not usually used um, in a design bid build 
situation uh, provision. And um, two to three percent, I think, on the big GCCM high schools nowadays are putting in about two and a half percent. So this could be several million dollars of, of contingency that's there. And the owner usually considers that his money. The contractor is, it just lives in the contractor's estimate for now, but it's his money because if he doesn't use it, he gets it all back anyway. So that's construction contingency. Buyout contingency is a little different. That's, um, that starts out as zero. It always starts out as zero. And then when the contractor starts to buy the job out, in other words, he's been awarded the job and he starts to buy it out. And if you go back to our sheetrock example, back in the first, in the first part of our time together today, uh, you, you, you came down and you, you were gonna buy sheetrock from this particular subcontractor for like $165,000. And now you're gonna go buy it out. And by buying it out, you all know what that means. You have to go back through the estimate. You have to go back through his proposal and you have to ask him questions. Do you include the installation of the hollow metal jams or not? And blah, blah, blah. Do you have the backing for the toilet accessories? All sorts of questions that you're gonna ask that subcontractor. And you may buy, the, you may buy his services for less money than you, than you had have in your estimate. Well, now you can move that difference into buyout contingency because you may face the same thing with your painter the next time uh, the, for the next for the next uh, for the next painting or if you buy painting next, you're going to face that if you have to buy it for more. So this moves up and down. Okay, you always hope at the end of the day when you're all bought out that you have uh, some money left in there because that's you kept by you. That's your money. You don't have to return that. Uh, and if it's negative, it's still your money, only you don't have it. So now you got to figure out what you're going to do. So buyout contingency is something that contractors um, care about and they manage and they watch it every time they buy a sub out. Okay. Uh, Larry, what would yep. be the purpose for a GC to buy a subcontractor out? Well, if you remember the, when, when you finish your estimate, you're going to have a price in there for, um, let's say, let, let's use the example we used a little while ago, the sheet rocker, okay? And you and you've, you you have a number in there for sheet rock, all right? And then, but you have to sign him up. You have to write a subcontract for him. And you're going to try to negotiate that. And you're going to go through and make sure that he has all the scope covered. And you may find that he has scope covered that others, somebody else may have as well. And this, this happens frequently. So you have to buy it out. By buyout, I mean you need to write him an agreement. He has given you a bid. You have used the bid. And in the hecticness of bid day, you may have not looked at everything carefully enough. I don't know if a lot of you on the call have been through bid day. You know what bid day is like. It's crazy. And so after you've after you've bid a job and you take a deep breath, now you're going to go and you're going to sit down and you look at all of these bids, and you're going to decide who you're going to use, and then you're going to go and you're going to buy it out. I have to write him an agreement for some number, and if the number is less than what you have in your estimate, then then that's called buyout. You've bought that out and you've you you have buyout savings, and if it's more than that, then you have a buyout loss. But that's why you would buy it out. You're going to buy out everything. Okay, did that make sense? Uh, yes and no, but okay. I was no, thinking- No, keep talking to me. You said earlier, uh, you know, that uh, that contractor might be doing the same work as another contract subcontractor that I've hired. Yeah. So by buying that out, you are trying to eliminate the duplication of work? Yeah, you're trying to eliminate the dupl duplication of work. So. If I have a door and hardware supplier and my door and hardware bid includes the, the, um, the installation of the hollow metal jams, okay, for instance, in walls. And then I go and I find out from my sheet rocker that he's also installing those, right? Now I got duplication of work scope. So now I'm gonna decide who am I gonna have do that work scope? And if I have the, the sheet rocker do it, then I'm gonna take it away from my door and hardware subcontractor. So now I have a, a positive Delta there. Do you see what I mean? Yes. 
Okay, that's called that number. That difference is buyout contingency. But who would you buy out from the low, the person that has the lower price or yeah. the person? Yeah, as long as I'm comfortable with that person doing the work, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so you will buy out from whoever is doing that work. Uh, yeah, who is low bidder? I mean, each person could do it, right? Okay. But who's who can do it the cheapest? Because then I'm going to take it away from the other fellow. Gotcha. All, all they yeah, all they're doing is giving me a bid, but it's it's up to me as to how I buy it. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. You bet. Uh, escalation. We talked a little bit about escalation before. Uh, again, it's a line item on a, a negotiated estimate. How do I predict the cost of construction at a future date from the date of the estimate? Um, right now, I think it's 4%. You could argue it's three and a half. You could argue it's four and a half, but it's about 4% right there. If I was going to estimate a job today, to start a year from now, I would put 4% of construction cost in that line, okay? And that's all it is. The crystal ball is cloudy. And again, schedule is critically important here because you have to know when the job's going to start. And we can we could go on and on about schedule and the value of pre-construction schedules and things like that. But schedule is critically important so that you can tell your client I presume that the job is going to start a year from now, and I put included 4% escalation. And um, then if it starts six, 18 months from then, and you've documented that, then you're entitled to another 2%, you could argue, right? So that's that's the benefit of being the contractor being involved early and being able to have those thoughtful and and helpful conversations with your client to talk about stuff like this, because this is this is so difficult to deal with. And yet you have to do it. I don't think it's an option to exclude it. Most everybody will take a run at it and be very careful as to how they how they describe it. OK, so that's that's the markup section. Larry, and we if, have a question yep. that came through just now. Mm -hmm. uh, it came from Nick. Does the escalation percentage differ from the type of work, such as excavation or drywall? Uh, contractors will usually escalate the, the, at the bottom line rather than trying to escalate each separate work scope. Um, and they're using an industry average right now. Um, what, we, what we usually did is we ask contractors to, to so, or subcontractors to give us pricing in today's dollars. And then we would escalate it once. Now, if you have a schedule, you can ask your subcontractors to give you pricing based on, on, a, on a date out in the future. You can certainly do that. And then they've built the escalation in. But general contractors would not go through every line item and try to figure that out. They would either ask their subs to give them a price based on a future start date or they would escalate the entire job at the bottom one time. Okay, did that answer the question? Nick, feel free to unmute yourself if you have um, Nick, any additional question. Yes. Nick, did that work for you? Yes. Okay, great. Any other markup questions? We're going to jump into GCs here in a minute. How are we doing on time? It's okay. We're doing okay. Okay, so let's go to general conditions. General conditions are what we call indirect cost. And by that, I mean there are costs that are not attributable to specific work activities. All right, everything else that we've talked about to date in the morning session was direct cost work, cost that I need to expend to actually build my building in place. The GCs are, are not costs that aren't attributable, attributable to any of those kinds of things. And as we talked about before, they're generally a function of time. So, Having a schedule is really, really necessary to have a reliable general conditions estimate. 
If you recall a few minutes ago, we talked about the different design stages of schematic design, design development, and, um, and construction documents. And every one of those estimates, general conditions still have to be included in those estimates. And what I teach in, in school is that at schematic, at schematic design, where you, the probability of not having a schedule is more certainly than it is later on. I try to tell them that you should put in a percentage for general conditions costs. And I usually tell them 8% is what I tell them, just because they're learning how to estimate. The, the, key, the key thing there with them is you need to know that you have general conditions. And here's at a high level, here's what's in general conditions. And for now, we're going to use 8%. Next quarter, we're going to get do a deep, deep dive into general conditions. But So it's a function of time. And if you don't have a schedule, then you have to put in a percentage. I say 7 to 10, somewhere in there. I use 8, OK? So the major cost components for general conditions are job, staff, and support. Uh, let me see if I'm going to get into any of those. No, I'm not. So job staff and support and and job staff and support is going to be um, all of the staff on your project, uh, your project manager, your superintendent, any senior project managers that you may have uh, or that would uh, that you would have on your job, uh, your project engineers, um, any any layout or engineering that you have to do. Certainly job site safety would be part of, uh, of um, job staff and support. Um, and I should have brought a list with me and I didn't, but uh, uh, layout and in, layout and batter boards, layout and engineering, mobilization and demobilization on the job site. Um, uh, I will send, I will send Leslie and Jessica a uh, uh, the template that you see here is for just job staff and support, but I'll send them the templates and they can send them to you so you can get an idea of how I look at GCs in terms of what's included um, and things like that. Equipment and supplies is usually all the equipment that you think you're going to need on your project, um, whether that's generators or forklifts or welding machines or whatever it might be and any kind of miscellaneous supplies and consumables that you think you're going to have. Um, if you have a, if you have superintendents on your job site and they have a company vehicle, um, then the, the rental of the company vehicle would be a part of equipment and supplies. Um, a lot of contractors these days own their own equipment. They own their, their concrete equipment and their their steel equipment, they own their trucks and their, and their any cars they may own and uh, forklifts and all the other equipment that you need on a project, they own those and then they lease them back or rent them back to their projects. It's a little bit of a profit sharing deal for them or a, a profit center for them. And, but that's where these pieces of equipment would live is in, um, is in the, um, uh, in equipment and supplies. Temporary construction. All of the construction that you need to build or to do on your job site that's going to be temporary. So what does that mean? That means uh, safety rails. That means Santa cans. That means temporary offices and furniture and cleaning of the offices, temporary power, temporary water, temporary um, heat. Um, uh, Anything that's temporary that you're going to build, uh, that you're going to take away because you don't need it anymore, that's temporary, goes into temporary construction. Uh, and then office equipment and supplies is anything that you need to for your office, you know, whether that's um, paper, fax machine, or computer rentals, um, and cell phones, um, what else? Uh, fax machines. Uh, Anything like that uh, would be part of office equipment and supplies. So there's there's four major cost components, and they all have, you know, eight or ten or fifteen or whatever. Like job staff and support is pretty extensive. Work items that belong in there, and 
the key in, in estimating all of this, especially on the job staff and support and anything for that matter is, you know, how many months am I going to be on the job site? <clears throat> and generally job staff, salaried staff, as you, as you remember, we talked a little bit about that to keep that separate so you can put the appropriate labor burden cost on it. But job staff and support is usually a function of weeks because uh, in contractor speak, at least it was when I was working, is that employees are paid by the week because, and we usually paid our salaried employees by the week because that's how unions were paid, union employees were paid is by the week. So how many weeks do I have for my PEs or my project manager or my superintendent or whoever it might be? So you gotta think in terms of time rather than in terms of other kind of quantities, okay? Um, and, and, but with, with other work items, it might be by the month. If you're, if you're renting a pickup, it'll be by the month. If you're renting any equipment, it'll be by the month. Um, same way with office equipment and things like that. So it, it's mostly a function of time and you gotta have kind of time in your head as you're estimating general conditions. The other thing that, um, the, the other two pieces of, of, a, of um, a GCs are the major hoisting equipment. Um, if your project is needing a tower crane or they're needing a man and material hoist, then you would estimate these as a part of, but separate from general conditions. And, uh, and the reason is, is that, um, and I don't know how many general contractors are on the line, but if you're estimating tower cranes, you generally want your tower crane to be allocated to your direct work rather than general conditions. Contractors like to keep their general conditions lower than higher, okay? Owners will typically look at general conditions as a percentage and they'll think, okay, if it's 12%, it's too high. If it's 6%, it's too low. I'm gonna be somewhere in this seven to 9% range and if you come in with a high general conditions and you've got tower crane in there, then that's not good. You can explain it away, I'm sure. But we like to put our, our tower crane cost in our work scope. You know, and you can say it's going to be equally divided against with substructure and superstructure or closure, however you do it. But you get the tower crane out of there. You, you price it separately. Okay, and with the tower crane, you get, you have an operator at the tower crane, you have a rigger with the tower crane, and you have to bring it in and take it out and erect it and take it down. And, you know, it could be in the order of 65 to $75,000 a month for an operating tower crane. So you need to understand the cost of the crane and then how you're going to allocate the cost if you choose to get it out of, uh, out of general conditions. The man and material hoist is different. The man of material hoist again is required on, oh, and I'll probably get this wrong, but probably if you're up to what 80, 90 feet from the to the top occupied floor, you don't need one. But again, some of you may know more than I. But if you're if you're doing a 20-story building or a 10-story building, you're going to need a man of material hoist, right? And so you got to set it up, you got to take it down, you got to install it, you got to rent it. You got to do all of those things that you did with the tower crane, except you don't have a rigger, but you have an operator that sits in there and runs you up and down all the time. And the other component of the man and material hoist is that when you take it down, because when you take it down, you need to finish the exterior closure of the building where it, where it was, because you can't finish that at the same time. And then you have to use one of your permanent elevators as a as a v as a, a vertical hoisting of, of uh, to get men and material up the building and back down again uh, after the man hoist comes down so that operator has to move into the elevator and he sits on his little stool and you can't come in and punch floor five he has to punch punch floor five for you and that's just the way the unions have it set up so different to price the man and material hoist you have to finish you have to get rid of it first and then you have to have that operator stay on and that's you can only get rid of it when that when that elevator is operating 
and hasn't been signed off yet by 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 um, by by state electrical, but it's been signed off enough to use for temporary construction purposes, and that's what it's there for. Okay. General conditions are always the most subjective to price and develop. Why? Because they're different for every job. And I tell my students that you're going to struggle with this one because you just you got to think about it a little bit. It's not like taking off concrete. I got 10 footings and they're this size and that's pretty straightforward. You got to think about how many people do I want on my job? How many engineers do I need? How many engineers can I afford if I'm bidding at design bid build? Um, do I need a tower crane or not? How many Santa cans do I need? All of these things that that you got to think about through all four of those of those major cost components are are not just they're very subjective, not objective. And uh, you know how much time do I need for laying out my building, or how much or how much money am I going to put in for warranty, if any? Uh, you know how much how many lineal feet of safety rail do I need? You know those are the kinds of questions that you have to answer yourself um, or ask yourself an answer when you're pricing general conditions. And it can be very, very expensive if you if the schedule isn't right, you know, if you say that GCs are going to be, let's say they're fifty thousand bucks a month and you go two weeks late or two months late that can be pretty pricey for you. Or if you estimate two PEs and you really need three because the job is just that much more complicated, you know, again, those are the critical questions that you have to ask yourself when you go to price general conditions because um, uh, it's, it's you, an entry level person can't do it. I always say you gotta be a PM or greater to go price GCs and really understand the job. Uh, so anyway, and as, as I said before, generally seven to nine percent of the cost, okay, about. So I have run out of time on general conditions. Um, and I know we're done here a little early, but I maybe that's not such a bad thing. But um, I guess I'll open it up for any questions or comments that anybody might have. question yeah um, uh, if we go back to the labor burden um, when when you talk about that one? when you talk about 35 percent and 54 percent and 71 percent can you explain what those percentages are I'm not exactly sure what they mean I know when I bid um, jobs, I will take the prevailing wage and I'll just make it up. I'll say $35 is a prevailing wage. And then for all of those items that you have up there, I add about 23% because that's about what my costs are. My full uh, burden labor rate is about 23 to 24% on those. Um, so okay. I'm not sure what these percentages mean and if I'm thinking about it differently than what you're, you're showing us here. Right. Good question. Um, uh, are you you're a are you a non-union contractor? I am. Okay. Uh, well, I always say that 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 with the exception of the union dues, everything else will apply to uh, to salaried personnel. And again, this is this is what we've used over the years. Uh, because the salaried personnel don't have the union dues and benefits in them as far as as far as that that the union employees would have. Um, but you know if, if, if you're comfortable at 23 to 25, I think that's fine. Um, you know I, again, I'm coming from the perspective of a medium to large size uh, a general contractor. Um, you know, I think the whole point of labor burden here is to is to make sure that everybody knows that it's a component, it's an add-on, and it's a component of labor that you need to make sure that you understand. And I believe that you understand it. And if you're at at 
23 or 25 and you're comfortable with that and that works for you then i'm okay with that you know yeah we we're we are small so yeah. and i and you know i calculate i can i can backdoor into all of my costs i just wanted to make sure i understood what those were um and that i understood what you were yeah. talking about yeah. so so in your case if you have in a large um general contracting firm and you have somebody at $25, you're going to take an additional 35% of that $25 and add it on. And that's going to be the full burden rate. That's my burden rate. And that's what, what you know, and now you, we're not talking about billable rates. We're just talking about a burden rate. But yes, that's what I would do. If, yeah, if, I, if, if somebody wanted this, a burdened rate for a project engineer and a project engineer right now is what, it's 65,000 a year. So that's what, 30, $33 or whatever it is. Yep, that's what I would do and that would be my burden rate. Correct. Great. Okay. Um while I'm while I'm not muted, I have a couple more questions you if can I can. Ask away. Okay, so when you go to that fee when when we're back on that fee page. Sure. Hang on a minute. Who, who, oh, I I blasted by it, didn't I? Hang on a minute. Oh, where's my fee? Fee it was back it was there there it is sorry okay okay so on this fee um who charges for that and who pays it i wasn't clear who who pays the fee well who's so if you're a general contractor are you yeah. the one that's charging the fee to the owner oh absolutely yeah i've okay. got to make money on the job and that's what i'm gonna i'm, I'm gonna take all of my costs and the last thing that i'm gonna do is going to put a percentage on it for all of this, okay? Mm -hmm. And for all of that. And I will either put what three or four or five percent um, on it. But correct, the owner pays me a fee and he pays it every month as a through the, the application for payment process. Okay. And then the next question I have is. Um, you know, if we go through and you go forward, you have your overhead and main office overhead and profit. So those are the two components of the fee. And so I was going to ask about what would, and maybe this isn't fair and it's different for every trade, but I was just trying to figure out what, what percentage should be for profit. Well, uh, you know, that again, I think you said it, it'll be different for every company, depending on how big a company, how big a company they are and the kind of work they do and what their, what, what their overhead is. Um, you know, if, if you're at a, if, if you're at a 3% fee, um, you know, or let's say you're at a 4% fee, you, you know, if, if you have, if your office overhead annually is 2% of revenue, then you're going to have a 2% profit margin. Now, if you're doing a billion dollars a year and you're not, but if you are, that's a big number. Um, if you're doing a half a billion dollars, 500 million a year, you know, it's still a big number. So, and and everybody is going to be different. And I don't know how how you mark up your jobs. Sounds like you're a fairly small organization. So probably your fees are going to be higher. Would that be correct or not? Yes. Yes, they're higher. All right. Yes, I'm, I'm sure they would be. Um, okay. Yeah, and and I I don't want you again. I, I'll 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 tell you that I'm coming at this from from a from a general contractor's perspective that's doing a hundred to two hundred million dollars a year. Now, if you're doing yeah. fifty thousand a year or a hundred thousand a year, then that's that certainly doesn't apply. But the concept still applies. That you, exactly you need to add fee on and whatever. Just like your labor burden example, you need to be very comfortable with what you're putting on. Um, I'm just telling you that don't forget fee. Because if you get fee, somebody else that sits in a window in an office with a bigger window than you is not going to be happy with you. And that's that's the main message here. No, I appreciate that. I would yeah. I just wanted to make sure I understood. You got it. And I think that was all of my questions other than if we could get a copy of these templates that you've showed us. Um, cause I've kind of built my own over the years, but, but I'd like to compare what I have to, to the sure. ones that you put together or you teach or what have you. So, cause I'm sure I'm missing things. So I appreciate your time. 
Uh, oh, I've learned a lot. So Good. thank you. Well, thank you. I'm glad for that. And yes, I will send uh, Leslie uh, uh, and Jessica the templates that I've used today, and then they can uh, they can distribute them. Uh, no pride of ownership or authorship for sure. Let's see. I, I sorry, I muted myself again. There's one thing on the sales tax, and I know that this is probably more of a of a general cost. But one of the things that I found out, um, you know, as I went into these different jurisdictions, is that all of the cities have their own B and O um, taxes and licensing. And I hadn't taken that into consideration at one point when I was doing business in Tacoma and I was like, oh, well, their fees like $250. And that's not a huge amount of money. I understand. But um, there, so there's not only the sales tax, but there's also if you're not doing business in that city already, you, you are going to incur a cost for licensing if they have it. Well, yeah. And don't don't confuse sales tax with with the B&O tax. OK, the, the one that you see there. What, no, what, no, I understand. Yeah, right. That that the B and O tax is your is the, the the what you pay to do business in that city, right? And in the state of Washington, the sales tax is totally different. It's ten point. Well, it varies by the city. I'm doing a job in Port Angeles right now, and it's eight point four in Port Angeles. It's ten point one in Seattle. I don't know where you do business. I don't know if Tacoma is probably less than 10.1 or two, I don't know. But they're two distinct and separate taxes. One of them, you on that one, you include in your estimate because that's a cost to you, okay? This one you don't include in your estimate because it's a cost that the owner pays to you below the line on the monthly pay applications. Correct. I, I, um, I misspoke. What I was trying to get at was the the licensing um, on the on the fee. B &O tax. Yeah. Well, the licensing for like Tacoma, um, you know, and Puyallup, you have to pay a separate licensing fee to do uh, business there, besides yes. the rate that you're paying for your tax. Right. Right. And and you know and. You know, you can you can have business license and it's let's say it's what five hundred bucks a year. I don't know what it is. I have no clue. I used to be a consultant, but I can't remember what I paid to do for my business license. But um, you know, you could argue that that would be office overhead. Uh, yes. You know, or you could put it in as a job cost. You know, I mean, it you that kind of thing um, you can decide. Uh, you know, I think I think it's good that you're thinking about it. And that you're saying, yeah, where where does this cost live for me? And if it lives in in overhead, then that's fine. But if it doesn't, then and how do I spread that over the work that I do? That's the problem with business licenses and things like that. It's hard to allocate it on every little job. It gets to be pretty small dollars at that point. That's that's correct. And I'm not I'm not disagreeing with you there. Yep. What I wanted to state was that when I was kind of talking about the templates and I have my own and and wanted to use some of yours, one of the things that I found, you know, that I hadn't taken into consideration when I was bidding on other jobs was that license fee for that job. And you're right, it's not it's not expensive, right. but it is something that's added if you hadn't thought about it as all. Exactly right. Yep, you're absolutely right. Anybody else have any questions? I love questions. I think that's the best way to learn is to ask questions. Renee, thank you for all your questions. I actually learned a lot just by you asking Larry your questions. So thank you for that. And everybody else, please keep your question coming. There's no good questions or bad questions. No, absolutely not. So well, Larry, this, this is Leslie. Um, back when you were talking about the sales tax issue, mm -hmm. and uh, if you could go back to that slide, 
Yeah, you had a, a number on there uh, as a 0.65% and a 1.5%. Um, oh, um, you mean on right the, yeah. okay, on the bond. So um, the 0.65 and the 1.5, uh, can you expand on that? This is not the actual sales tax rate, is that? No, no, right. no. This, no, this is the rate for the bond premium. If if you had a, and and rates and rates will will esc, will go up and down a scale depending on the size of the project. If you're going to bond a ten million dollar project, it's going to cost you more on a percentage basis than if you're going to bond a hundred million dollar project. So let's say you're going to bond a hundred million dollar project, and your rate is going to be 065 percent of a hundred million dollars. So my math tells me that that's going to be about what 65,000 or is that 650,000? Yeah. That's 650,000 dollars for the bond premium, okay? That's what that means. The sales okay. tax rate is 10%. And and the point of the bonding of the tax is to make sure that you <clears throat> you add the sales tax to your contract amount before you calculate the bond premium. <laughs> and and you you said that the owner pays the sales tax. The owner pays the sales tax to the contractor as a part of the application for payment, but outside of the outside of the contract amount. Okay. And what we do when we advise owners on projects that we're working on, that the sales tax is a soft cost, a soft cost to his project budget. His project budget consists of hard costs, which is construction costs, which, which what is, is what we've talked about today. And then soft costs, which is all the rest of the costs that he's obligated for. One is sales tax, two is design, three is other consultants, four is FF and E, five is testing and inspection, all those things that 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 go into a project budget that contractors don't necessarily concern themselves with because they're estimating construction costs or hard costs. Yeah. But okay. for us as owners reps, we have to be be aware of and involved in the total budget, including the soft costs. And that's what the sales tax is, is a soft cost to the owner, not a hard construction cost. Okay, perfect. Thank you. You bet. Hi, Larry, it's Andrew again. Hi, Andrew. Um, during the break, this is a little off topic, not quite. You guys mentioned a couple of bundles of software that are in current use. And last time I worked on a bid was 2015. So software was not much of a conversation. There's a lot of scribbling with pencils. Yep. So I was wondering when you talk about uh, Bluebeam, is that like just bluebeam.com, their review software? Uh, well, that... blue, yeah, I, again, I'm, I'm, not the, I'm not the expert either, Andrew. Um, but yeah, Bluebeam is a software that will allow you to go to a PDF document and and actually quantify areas and count and, and measure lines and and do all those things, you know. Uh, and then it 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 calculates it and it puts it into a format that you can print out. And some Bluebeam even 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 translates directly over into an Excel spreadsheet. Then when you can put into Timberline or anything like that, I can't remember what Timberline is called now from an estimating software, but but the Bluebeam or the OST on-screen takeoff is is actually used to um, to uh, to quantify uh, shapes and sizes and 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 quantify everything that you're that you usually used to do by hand. And that's what I'm looking at. Is it yep. looks like these both make everything look so easy, oh, and it's like oh, oh I should download oh, these. And learn them. Let me tell you, I mean, I have students in my class who can run circles around me. I always ask for a hard set of documents because, you know, I, I, again, I'm faster than they are just measuring myself. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not saying I'm too old to learn anything, but I don't need to learn, learn Bluebeam. I learn, I need to know that it's there and I need to teach them to go find it, you know, and they're smart enough to, to, to learn it. And they have instructors at the UW who actually teach people how to use it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's revolutionized the industry. And if you could see some of the ways that they, that they track changes and create and do, do change orders. Yeah. I want to make, 
I want to move this column over here and I'm going to move this column over here so I can make my drive aisles wider and I need to put a concrete beam over the top of this. How much is that going to cost? Oh, A, B, C, D. Yeah, it'll cost you X because it goes back and grabs your cost out of your database. And I mean, it's amazing. It really is. It's a great time to be alive. But thank it you. Sure is. You betcha. So just uh, some other note I recently learned in one of my other classes that I'm taking is that if you have LinkedIn, they have LinkedIn training now. So you go to your LinkedIn and you go to their learning section and they have um, multiple blue beam tutorials that are free. It doesn't cost you anything. And so it talks about how to manage your submittals, how to do your layouts, how to count your things. I mean, it's just all in there for free. So if you do do the blue beam, there's lots of training programs. It makes a huge difference. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah, much faster too. Except if, if except if you're racing me manually, right? <laughs> How are we doing, Leslie? Well, I think that if we uh, don't have any, if we don't have any questions right now, maybe Larry, uh, you can give us some insight as to what's coming you know, up in the future, uh, your forecasts on projects and, and things happening uh, in Washington state? Boy, that's a loaded question, isn't it? My goodness. Um, uh, well, for, first of all, um, <laughs> <laughs> Vanner, um, Vanner is uh, our primary market right now is K-12 education and K-12 schools. And again, you got to remember that we're owners reps. Uh, we're not contractors, nor are we designers. But there's there's a lot of there's there's, there's a lot of work coming up in, in public education. I know that that we know many school districts that are preparing for to going out for bonds this year and next year. Um, so uh, you know certainly there's I think a, a bright future for for K twelve education. Um, Sound Transit is is you know to the extent that anybody wants to work for Sound Transit, they certainly there's certainly a lot of opportunities there. Um, the public sector is we don't get as involved in the public sector as we'd like to be, but um, you know I think uh, I I think the advent of Zoom and the fact that Zoom will permanently change the way people work, I believe permanently even when you can go back, may drive down the office market a little bit, unless your name is Mr. Amazon or Mr. Microsoft or Mr. Google. Um, uh, water, wastewater, and, and you know, what, what we call not, not vertical construction. I know we're, we're getting involved in a lot of that. Um, it, it's hard for me to be specific because, uh, uh, you know, we, we kind of, respond to opportunities as they come along. I know that we're interviewing on on Thursday, as a matter of fact, for a facility for, for one of the tribes in the community. We've done a lot of tribal work. Um, tribal work that we're doing, we're finishing up one school right now for the Quinault, and we're doing another design build project for the Quileute tribe, uh, just north of Port Angeles, a couple of hours. Um, so a lot of tribal work coming up. I know the Muckleshoots are out there doing a lot of work. Um, you know, uh, that's kind of the, the, the world that we live in and that's what we try to keep track of. Um, you know, I'm not suggesting that any of you wanna go build buildings for Amazon or Microsoft, but there's, there's a lot of work. I still think the market, it's, I think the market is starting to flatten. You know, I think as, as the market flattens, the escalation is going to start to drop, and that's where we can see that. Um, but um, yeah, I think there's still a lot of work out there for se several years to come before. It's not going to drop off like it did before. I think it'll gradually go down. But I, I hope that answers it. it. You know, it's it's um, uh, it's it's difficult to 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 say. Although I can, I'm encouraged by the fact that there's lots of opportunities out there. And um, uh, you just have to go find them. And I think that 
public education is going to continue on for quite a while because there's a lot of schools out there that need greatly need upgrading and and uh, I, I could name a few they're they're in desperate need of of upgraded and new new facilities and Larry if um, any of our sap contractors want to get a hold of you to, or even to know what you have come up on the pipeline yeah. is a way uh, a better way for for them to get that information I or? can certainly um i should have put it on here and i didn't um but i can uh, what i will send you my contact information uh, jessica and you can forward that on would that be okay absolutely yeah yeah or, or my email at vanner is fine sure. and i think okay. you i think you have that that'd be perfectly fine okay yeah great Well, I, I think that kind of wraps things up unless we have any last minute questions. Um, well, I we let you out of class 20 minutes having, early today. Uh, Vanner on board. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> we, uh, um, you guys will be on board for our networking event on April 20th. Yes, and I believe, we, I believe know, Tom Reese to, is. Maybe, uh, yeah, Tom, Tom and, and, and maybe Craig. Craig and you. I'm, uh, yeah, but, I, I, um, I'm aware of it, yes. That, that, yeah, that, that'll, that'll be an awesome event. Um, we'd like to thank you for your time and your preparation and uh, getting this pulled together for us. Uh, Vanner really has contributed a lot to this particular series of events. And I know that SBTRC and, and PTAC are very, very thankful and, and appreciative. Um, and the, uh, the follow-up documents and the link to the video will be available soon and we'll notify you with that information as, as soon as we um, get that. Um, I, so I, I think that's probably all with me. Um, thank you, Larry, for coming and spending your time. And we know you got to uh, get prepped for your, your class at, at 4 o'clock or 4.30. So uh, any, any other questions? Anybody like to say anything before we head out? Well, let me just say that okay. I've, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed being here today, folks. And um, I... I um, I, I enjoy what I teach. Uh, the only difference between today and what will happen at 430 is I require my students to have their cameras on uh, so that I can see them. And, um, <laughs> and the good news is I don't have to remember their names because if I'm in class, I have to remember 24 <laughs> names and now their names are right there and I can see them. But, but no, I thank you for your attention. <laughs> great, great questions. Um, and uh, Jessica and Leslie, thanks for your leadership on this. We've enjoyed it. I know that Craig and Tom are looking forward to, to being with you on the 20th, and, and I believe it's on my calendar as well, so would enjoy participating on, on that too. So anyway, thank you so much, and it's been a wonderful three hours for me. Thanks again. Thank you, Larry. Okay, right. we'll talk Thanks, to you soon. Larry. You bet.